Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to our first worship of the uh, past the birth of our newborn king. And what a wonderful and joyous time that is. Welcome to you all, and a special welcome to those who are joining us online. We uh, really appreciate your being with us on uh, this last Sunday of the old year and the first of the celebrations past our Savior's birth. Um, just wanted to remind visitors and guests to fill out the attendance cards, and visitors, please stop at the uh, table in the lobby to get some additional information that we have for you all. Uh, also notice the uh, words about Holy Communion in our uh, worship folder. Just a couple of uh, brief announcements this morning. Uh, for the uh, Bible study hour this morning at uh, 9.40, we will be showing a Christmas video in A112. So come to A112 for our, Bible, our adult Bible study hour today. And uh, secondly, if you purchase one of these beautiful poinsettias, you're welcome to take it home with you after the second service today. And uh, there will be a women's Bible study on Tuesday at 9.30 in room A112. And with that, let us uh, stand and uh, sing our opening hymn, number 384. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's take time to reflect, to come before our merciful God, 
confessing whom we have been and depending on His grace and His mercy. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As an ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I declare your sins hereby forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We'll read responsively Psalm 111 by verse. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine forth. Before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up your might and come to save us. Restore us, O God, let your face shine that we may be saved. O Lord God of hosts, how long will you be angry with your people's prayers? You have fed them with the bread of tears and given them tears to drink in full measure. You make us an object of contention for our neighbors and our enemies laugh among themselves. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. And to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Glory be to God on high, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. We praise Thee, we bless Thee, we worship Thee. We glorify Thee, we give thanks to Thee for Thy great glory. O Lord God, Heavenly King, God the Lord Almighty, O Lord God, the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, O Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, that takest away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. Thou that takest away the sin of the world, receive our prayer. Thou that sittest at the right hand of God the Father, have mercy upon us. For Thou only art holy, Thou only art the Lord, Thou only, O Christ, with the Holy Ghost, art most high in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, our Maker and Redeemer, you wonderfully created us and in the incarnation of your Son, 
yet more wondrously restored our human nature. Grant that we may ever be alive in him who made himself to be like us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. verses 1 to 3a and then 11 to 15, and can be found on page 55 of your pew Bible. Exodus chapter 13, beginning at the first verse. The Lord said to Moses, Consecrate to me all the firstborn. Whatever is the first to open the womb among the people of Israel, both of man and of beast, is mine. Then Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which you came out from Egypt, out of the house of slavery, for by a strong hand the Lord brought you out from this place. When the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore to you and your fathers, and shall give it to you, you shall set apart to the Lord all that first opens the womb. All the firstborn of your animals that are males shall be the Lord's. Every firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb, or if you will not redeem it, you shall break its neck. Every firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. And when in time to come your son asks you, what does this mean? You shall say to him, by a strong hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. For when Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of animals. Therefore, I sacrifice to the Lord all the males that first opened the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons I redeem. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle reading is from Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 to 17 and can be found on page 984 of your pew Bible. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel, according to St. Luke the second chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. And when the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ, and he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms 
and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed. And a sword will pierce your own soul too, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. And when they had performed everything according to the, word, to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We are so grateful that the Christ child has been born among us. And we have this joy of knowing that Father has given his Son and that by his Spirit we are redeemed. Let us proclaim this truth with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated as we join to sing hymn 383.
God's grace and peace be to you this first Sunday within the Christmas season. Amen. Howdy. Well, I have to answer the question that has come up from time to time. What in the world is wrong with your face? So, yes, I've got this nice little gash uh, right here. And uh, and discussing it is that there was this whole idea of you got to come up with a really good story for it. You know, like you should see the other guy or, oh, man, they'll never insult my mother ever again. You know, that kind of a thing. But the truth is, is that, you know, truth is stranger than fiction. And I literally was at four in the morning having a dream that there was a spider on the wall. I think I had like anxiety or something. And the thing had come at me and I woke up. You know, you wake up from a dream, right? Except then for whatever reason, something, I still have no idea what it was, brushed against my face at that exact moment. And I'm like, Wah! and the thing is that it's like, I knew that it had been a dream. But then all of a sudden at this moment, I'm like, and there's really a spider here. And I must have gone at least two feet in the air. I don't know. And came crashing down on the bedside table right there. And I'm like, oh, that hurt. Why does this feel wet? And, and realize I'm going to need to drive myself to the ER. So, uh, th- three hours later and some stitches inside and everything else. And it, I'm sure there'll be a nice little line over time. And one of these days, my, uh, my family will uh, see this sermon and realize I didn't tell you all. So, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Merry Christmas. Um, so, but that, that was on Tuesday. Um, so, with that, though, is, is that uh, I still managed to get through faster than people trying to get their COVID test. So, um, with that, though, is this reality of asking the question of what it means to have faith. And the reason why I say that is because at that moment in time, I knew up here that I just had a dream. I knew up here I had woken up. I knew up here that the spider was in that other dream and that I was back in the real world. And yet, at that moment in time, anything could have brushed my face. Who knows? And yet, at that moment in time, my heart betrayed me. And I tried to get away from that imaginary spider as fast as I could. And that's the thing, oftentimes, is that we sometimes misunderstand what it really means to have faith, what it is that faith actually entails, and why it is that faith is more than just the things that we say or the things that we have in our head, but rather is about what transforms each and every part of our lives and the world around us. And so what I thought I would do is I thought I'd go ahead and uh, preach the entire Bible today. So, go ahead and get yourself settled, okay? This will be a while, all right? So, uh, so starting with Genesis, as everybody's like, "Uh, he's serious? Eh, kinda. You know me. Now, going through is that oftentimes we kind of miss the point. So, talking a little bit about what Pastor Tyler had mentioned yesterday is that we sometimes kind of lose focus, And the perspective that we lose ends up causing us to miss out on where we're meant to go with things. And there are some major parts that come up in Scripture. And as you worship together over time, you end up hearing these events, these themes come up time and time again. And I wanted to make sure that I brought them back into context for a moment. You see, whenever we start off with the Bible, and we look at the creation, and that there's this seven-day pattern that shows the first three days where God's creating on this grander scale where you have light and dark, and then the expanse separating between the sky and the waters below, and then the land coming out. And then you have the second period of three days where the stars, the, the sun, the moon, the stars, everything that's up in the skies is formed. And then you realize that there's also going to be the birds and the sea creatures. And then the sixth day is all the land creatures, including yours truly and yourselves. And with that, we finish with the day of rest. Bless you. And with that is realizing that this natural rhythm is something that we can't change, but also 
is meant to be something that resides with us and is meant to be a natural way of not only living our lives, but also of glorifying God. Because every seven days, we need a chance to step back. Not just to physically rest from a world that is exhausting, but also to mentally step back and to see what God has been doing in our lives. And then we see Adam and Eve going around the garden, in a sense being the Chip and Joanna Gaines of the time. I don't know what it was to be a fixer-upper in the garden because, you know, everything's already set up and Joanna's probably like, but look at, you know, the, the, the shiplap behind the fireplace. It's always the shiplap. I don't know what it is. And, and Chip's like, yes, honey. Okay, got it. All right. Um, I don't know. Um, but he, he, he breaks stuff down. But with that, though, is the social media influencer at the time, decided to slither up in a tree and to say, are you sure of what God said? But the thing is that as much as the snake came up with its alternative facts and decided to come up and give a new picture is that Eve didn't just lean on God. Instead, it started to create this straw person of who God was. Well, we can't eat it. We can't even look at it. It's not what God said. And instead of leaning on who God truly was, it started, started to create this idea of a God who is just so demanding. And then, of course, Adam went along with it. And I'm sorry, but if you're a guy spending your whole time with a naked woman in the garden, you're probably just going to say, yes, my honey, the whole time. It just is what it is. But with that, is that instead of asking what it was to have faith in the God who truly existed, instead of actually checking with God when that snake was there, instead, they decided to start coming up with their own ideas of what they should or shouldn't try out. And then you've got Abraham. Oh, don't want to skip Noah's flood. Totally can't believe I didn't put that in the notes. My bad. Sorry, Noah. Um, and yeah, so Genesis 6, make sure I put that in there as well, is that Noah's over there building this gigantic boat, and there was not going to be any normal rain that we know it that we would be worried about. This wasn't Houston, okay? There wasn't like every year you're going to be having floods, and you hope that somebody comes along in the local, you know, Coast Guard boats. This was a time when that wasn't even an issue, and yet in the midst of it, by faith, he goes and he builds this gigantic boat and brings all these animals inside that no one would ever think to put inside of a boat. And yet he and the other seven members of his family were the only ones who were able to survive. And then we get to Abraham. Once we get to Genesis 11 and realizing that this was someone who had no children of his own. And back then, that was devastating. As much as it is hard enough as it is, in today's world, not to have one's own children, is that at the same time back then, that was the difference between life and death. When you're older, who is going to make sure that you still have someone to take care of you, but also you need people to run everything because you're raising your own food and taking care of everything. And yet, at that moment in time, God is saying, I have a future for you. And a hundred years into it, he finally sees it. Kind of puts perspective on wondering why our resumes didn't get picked up after three months. But with that, though, is that this whole time is that how many options were in front of Abraham that he walked past? Ishmael probably wasn't the only option that he had to struggle with at the time. And then Moses, trying to deal with the fact that these people, in order to keep their identity, continue to be a lower class. To continue to be the ones who don't worship this pantheon of Egyptian gods, but instead say, there is one true God that we trust in, and we are his people, and to continually be in this way of life. And yet, instead of fearing God the way that the Egyptians taught we were supposed to do, instead, they trusted this God and followed him into a wilderness with nothing. 
all in the belief that someday they would be brought to the place that they were meant to be. David was a man of war, but he wasn't justifying his flaws. He was owning up to them. You see, in today's context, we don't really ask for forgiveness for our flaws. We just make reality television out of it. So then that way the whole world can see it, discuss it, put it on morning television, and then later on we can get a new season as long as the ratings are high enough. But at a time when kings were allowed and meant to be unquestionable, when Nathan pointed out what he had done, he confessed before God and accepted the consequences. The thing is that all of this still did not communicate to the people over the centuries who God truly was. And so over time, both the people and their leaders, they lost sight to the point where they just kind of went along with what everybody else was doing around them, changed up where their altar might be, even what their practices were. And eventually God had to finally say, you're not being the people that I called you to be. But when they got cast out and sent to Assyria and Babylon, it was with the belief that God's promise of restoration someday, 70 years from then, would truly be. And then when that did come, they did leave this place that frankly was probably fairly wealthy compared to a destitute land that they had abandoned seven decades before. But all of this ended up taking a step by step to Jesus. Someone who was one of the people. We just spent the last few weeks looking at the fact that he was not what we thought of as a traditional king. He wasn't somebody up on this throne where, where, where all of these soldiers and all these guards are protecting him day and night, but instead is the angels come and declare who he is and then they seem to disappear. And then he has to go back to a regular life eating Cheerios and trying to learn arithmetic while wondering why Thundercats wasn't on TV that day. I know, I know, it wasn't really Thundercats, it was G.I. Joe, but still. With that, though, is realizing that instead of asking what it was to be in a role of position, is instead his power came from being who God had called him to be. His power was not in position. His power was in the being that God had called him into. And the thing with that is that as much as we saw this death of his as not being from his own doing and not of his own guilt, is that then we end up seeing that this blood that was innocent conquered death and did not stay there anymore. And from then on is that Having faith in being God's people wasn't just about saying this is my practice in the life here, but is also saying this is the life that I have to eternity. This is the life that I will rise up into. And even now with the church is that there is life beyond this. Our meaning is not just what we can sap from out of the world. It is not just, did I manage to have enough experiences that I feel like my Instagram wall is popular and I will have 10,000 followers? I don't have 10,000 followers. I think I got 20. I don't know. But, so, thanks, George. Um, but with that, though, is realizing that instead is that being the church is realizing that each and every moment of our lives here matter to the same God who made us and redeemed us and said, I am not leaving you to nothing. Even to the point of leading us to what will happen on the last day. See, a lot of times um, people ask the question, you know, well, what, 
what's your end times theology? And I, I try not to get too, you know, hard and fast on all of that. But I struggle with the idea of God kind of sort of coming and picking people up and then disappearing without bringing in his reign because it says in Scripture, what will he see you doing when he comes? Not, oh, hey, good to see you. And asking this question of, what is it that we are meant to be? What is it that we're meant to do? And that is why I think oftentimes we miss the point because, oh, and congratulations, I just did all of Scripture. Yeah, okay. With that is realizing that oftentimes we actually place our faith in faith. Oh, great. He's just going off on one of these tangents. I know, I know. Don't worry. There are no Gilmore girls in this one. But having faith in faith is oftentimes this idea that as long as we're saying the right things and thinking the right things, and that somehow if we put the right things down in our bulletins and we keep the Bible... There you go. I believe all the things that I'm supposed to believe in. And yet, what is faith in God? What do we see throughout Scripture and throughout the life of the church? What we see is that faith in God is not just, I said the right thing at the right time. It is that every piece of our life is transformed because we know who God is, and trust Him. Everything in your life changes because we know God and because we trust Him. The thing is that as I'm wandering off to the ER with a towel on my forehead, holding this, thinking to myself, how am I going to tell everybody that an imaginary spider broke my face? (laughs) Which is actually a lot easier than I thought it would be. But the whole time is not this continual thinking of, oh no, what if this is the end? The truth is, is that at each place and each step along the way is that I've never been skydiving. I don't have a giant mansion. I'm definitely not on any sort of reality TV shows of the you know rich and famous and pastors of Houston, Texas. I don't know. That'd be a terrible show. Don't start that. But rather is that at that moment in time is knowing that I am still in God's hands. To the point where the next day is I was fo- able to focus on my coworkers who were struggling with things. Or then realizing the times when we needed to come together and check on everyone for Christmas. And then even the way that Pastor Tyler was speaking about how there are so many that right now feel loneliness and depression. And to know that at that moment in time, Life is fragile. It is short. But if Christ were to come back again, would he see me obsessing over something that really is inconsequential or would he see a life lived out in faith? Believing, not just to say, you know what, I'm a Christian, so let me do these things because that's what I'm supposed to do, but instead saying every single thing in my life is dedicated to God because God has given me hope and life and meaning. And that's what I want to put forward to you today. It's not that I want to say to you, it's not that I want to ask, will you follow Jesus? Because oftentimes we then get this kind of idea of, if I ask you, will you follow Jesus? Now I'm waiting for you to prove to me, okay, Now show me, are you going to follow Jesus or not? No. 
Because this is not a, I'm leaving you to there, and I'm over here, and I'm waiting for you to prove that you're going to come over here to our side. Is instead, I'm going to say to you, come, follow Jesus. Because the word of God is saying by faith that God is calling you now. This isn't whether you are or are not enough for God or whether you do or do not think enough about God. This is not whether you've said enough things and frankly being out there in the rest of this world and that you're wondering to yourself, why in the world did I even get up on a Sunday morning the day after Christmas to listen to this guy dressed in a bathrobe? I swear I don't shower in this. But rather is to say to you, you are a person that Christ has died for. He did come back to life. And because of that, you don't need to deal with me. You don't need to deal with us. You don't need to deal with the fact that we keep messing it up. You're right, we do. But our faith is not in this institution and our faith is not in the things that we say. Our faith is in a God who is bigger than us and has sent his son. And I am telling you, he says to you, come. Because this is for you. And deep down inside, his spirit is saying, this is true. I'm not asking, will you follow Jesus? I'm saying, follow Jesus. I swear, I've got two minutes left. I swear. I really don't. I probably went over a while yet, but I preached the whole Bible after all. But that's also more than that. Is to realize that whenever we talk about what it is to be discipled, is that I don't want us to try to come up with more things for us to do and more activities just to say we're busy. But instead, what they learned in the exile is that the reason why we gather is because this world keeps pulling us away and keeps showing us something that ignores a loving and merciful God. And so together, how can we build each other up? How can we talk about what we've been going through and how can we be changed together? Because that's the whole point of being together. Is that the iron sharpens the iron and we become more like Christ because we share in this faith together. So today, I'm not asking you to try to figure out what our next big hoopla is going to be. I'm not asking you to try to have everything figured out on what your life is going to be next. And I'm not asking you to think that you've said or thought every single thing. I, probably somebody believes something a little bit different from me somewhere out there. I don't know. Just because I'm right all the time, that's okay. God still loves you. Sorry, Mom. But what I am saying is that the same God who has been true since before time began is still true today. And that changes everything. So I'm asking you, if you hear me, don't hear whether you are or are not going to follow Jesus. Instead, by his spirit, I'm saying, come. And let us live this life of faith together so that we can build each other up and so that we can be the people that God has called us and redeemed us to be. Thanks be to God. Y'all can shake it off. I know, I know. The breach the whole Bible. Oh man, you got you know, kind of get that off. So why don't you stand up and why don't we pray together? Lord God, we come to you and see that oftentimes we get caught up in our own minds, in, in our own thoughts, and in our own ways of doing things. And God, the truth is, is that faith is not in what we're saying. Faith is not in the way that we want to look at things. Faith is not in our institutions, but rather is that you are our God. 
and that because you are our God and you are the merciful God, you have shown yourself to be sending your son for us and not leaving him in death, but rising, raising him back to life and conquering it for us. We know that that changes our hearts and our lives. Lord God, change our hearts and our lives that everything about us would reflect you and the faith that we have in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, we know at this time that there are many who struggle in mind and body, in soul and spirit. Lord God, we have been through this time and oftentimes there are so many that wait for the 25th of December to be over because it feels too empty for them. God, we ask that you would send us forth with your word of blessing and compassion and healing so that we would be there for them as your messengers to bring your love and to bring your hope at times when it does not always stand out the way it should. And Lord, for those who have struggled physically, especially during this recent rise in COVID, God, we ask that you would give us patience to be there for them, we ask you to give them physical healing. And Lord God, pull us through this because it is apparent that none of us seem to, on our own, know how to fix this. So God, please. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, our prayer. prayer. And Lord God, we thank you that this week and forevermore, we get to sing your praises. We thank, we thank you that everything about us is transformed according to your will. We thank you that while we do it imperfectly now, we know that someday you will be here to restore it to us perfectly. And we thank you for continuing to disciple us, even as our Lord showed us how to live and how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much for joining us online. We're going to have an opportunity to uh, pass around the offering. We're just really glad you were able to join us today. We also want to make sure that we express thanks and gratitude for those of you out there. You're not able to be here, but you have continued to be faithful in giving of yourselves to the church and its mission. And we just want to say thank you and that you do matter in everything you have done. And if anything that we are doing reflects that, then we're just thankful that we are using the gifts wisely. So go in God's peace. Serve the Lord. Amen. At this time, we bring our offerings to the Lord, and we hear from the choir.
Thank you very much. Please rise. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord, whose way John the Baptist prepared, proclaiming him the promised Messiah, the very Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and calling sinners to repentance, that they might escape from the wrath to be revealed when he comes again in glory. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. We are thankful for the opportunity to come and receive God's blessing of body and blood in this meal. He has shed his blood and his body on the cross, and in celebrating this meal, we receive the forgiveness that he has promised us by saying, this is my body which is given for you, and this is the New Testament in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. So let us receive it together with joy and thanksgiving, gluten-free on the side and alcohol-free in the center. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Please rise. Thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people. A light to light and the Gentiles and the glory of thy people is Rael. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you, and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Amen.